And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have four <laughs> new newcomers into the temple. In the, in the first corner, we have Daniel Brockway. In the second corner, we have David Brockway. In the third corner, we have Jacob Schmidt, who probably really hates hearing Jingleheimer. And <laughs> in the in the final corner, we have Matt... Jeez, I'm, I know I'm going to screw this up. Matt, Z Matt Zablodil. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I I knew I was going to I knew I was going to screw it up, but you'd think I'd learn after get after um getting my ass kicked when it came to Slavic pronunciations. <laughs> yep. That was pretty close. But they are the four-headed monster that it that is Fire Lizard Games. So, hello. yes, yep, hello, that's everyone. us. Mm -hmm. that, yep. How are you? How are you guys doing today? Hopefully, not being set on fucking fire like I was today. Oh uh, yes, no, that is definitely the case. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's brutal, but uh, yeah. you know, doing pretty good. <laughs> it's actually a little less hot here today than it has been the last week, but still pretty pretty oh, brutal. Yeah. Saturday was brutal. I think it's more brutal here than it has been. <laughs> no. X. Yeah. Just trying to survive. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Now, and they had to. Like... Oh, go ahead. Now, I um, one of my traditions around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to Tabletop and what made it stick. Um, for me, uh, I started playing um, probably around when I was in fourth or fifth grade, I want to say. Um, I was kind of introduced to it to begin with uh, by my uncle. Um, but, uh, started playing with, uh, some, some buddies from, from school, uh, one of which is on this call and he, he'll, I'm sure mention that as well when he, when it comes to his turn. Um, but, uh, AD and D was, was my first game. Um, and I just, you know, I was already pretty obsessed with a lot of fantasy stuff. I really, I was really into a lot of that sort of thing. And I wasn't really familiar with with role playing games. I had heard D and D, you know, I'd, I'd heard the words before, you know, the phrase, but I didn't really know what that was. And um, we had a, a friend whose older brother was into um, some of the older editions of D and D, as well as as well as AD and D. And I think that's kind of where we first got our hands on some of the books. And uh, you know, it, it really just kind of blew up from there uh it, for me personally it was seeing the monster manual the the ad and d monstrous manual just modified the whole thing for me i just i loved all the artwork i loved all the creatures the stats i i mean i could just sit there and pour over that book time and time again you know and so it just um yeah that that that's how i got into it i'll go next david mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, we'll keep it in the family here. So uh, my first introduction to it was actually from Daniel. He, you know, had, had those AD&D books that he was just talking about. Um, and yeah, he's seven years my elder. So, you know, of course. You just had to say that. I, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but really, you know, I was the younger brother who you know, wanted to do all the cool stuff my older brother was doing. So that was definitely my first introduction to it. Um, but then I kind of fell off of it for a long time. Um, uh, through middle school and high school, I was always kind of interested in that kind of stuff. And I was interested in fancy games, but I didn't have a lot of other friends who were 
also, you know, into tabletop or anything like that. And that was kind of before, I mean, that's really when the internet and online, you know, uh, gaming groups and stuff like that had really even just gotten started. So um, I had kind of fallen out of it for a while. And then I'd say, you know, as far as being super into it, um, you know, I'm probably the most recent of everyone here. I'd say probably around 2015 or so is kind of when I started getting back into it. Um, and, you know, this kind of tabletop renaissance that kind of came through the internet and online gaming. And uh, But since then, you know, I've played all sorts of different campaigns from, you know, 5th edition uh, to Pathfinder 1 and 2, Starfinder, Blades in the Dark... Uh, Dungeon World, Mouse Guard. I mean, I've I've kind of tried to dip my toes into as many different um, you know sections of of tabletop as I can since since I've gotten did back you, into it. Did you ever dip into Merp or and or anything Role Master based? I have not. No, I'm not familiar with that. Mm. Um. I'll sometimes bring up Role Master whenever I hear somebody complaining about ta about tabletop games being too complicated because they have sure. no idea how good they've got it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh. So that's just an old, an older older uh, version. Um, Role Master has a long and interesting history. Um. The big, the biggest contribution it ha one of the bigger contributions it has is being the system that was used for Middle Earth role playing, which was the first um, TTRPG that ha that had the official blessing of the Tolkien estate. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, apparently, the main reason for reason it was get it was able to get it is because nobody else asked it by that point. <laughs> Helps to be the first one to the table, <laughs> yeah, right? Sure. Um, well, it's not like I'm but, uh, one to talk. I'm I'm the kind of guy who go, who um at ev at every buffet table or every family dinner, I always say, "Everybody line up by height." I'm six six. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing that's, that's descending order. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, that's um, so. Yeah, that's that's pretty much my uh, my my backstory there. Um, I don't know, if Jake or Matt, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I can jump in. Keep it in alphabetical order here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I uh, got started about I think seventh grade. Um, my uh, stepbrother had played it a lot, and uh, basically his uncle of sorts um ran the first game for us and nearly killed us and honestly i was pretty hooked from that point on i i actually didn't play as a player for a long time after that uh because i just started running games um yeah i didn't run them all that frequently but when i did run them they'd be you know 10 hour oh sessions. so you're the forever dm <laughs> no not so much uh later on uh when i met daniel he really kind of became the uh the de, de facto uh, GM for us. Yeah, I hog that now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just really, uh, really enjoyed it and uh, got a little bit more into it in, in college and played some other stuff other than just D and D. And actually there was a EverQuest RPG I played in high school as well. Mm -hmm. Cause we had a little bit of that residual satanic panic stuff <laughs> at the small town I was living in. So uh, we just sort of hit it by just playing a basically the same game because uh, they had they put out a tabletop role playing game back in the early thousands. And then, uh, you know, went on to play a bunch of other stuff. Death Watch, Dark Heresy, um, uh, uh, just a whole lot of other stuff. I'm trying to think of what that early world. Of, it was pre World of Darkness, but uh, White Wolf. Magica? Uh, no, yep, was... Ars Magica, which was very... I, that's one of those games that I viewed as very complex. Uh, yeah, I, I got thrown off for a second because you said pre-world... You said 
You said pre World of Darkness. I was thinking, are you talking? Are you talking old world or new World of Darkness? No, <laughs> yeah, no, ours mag Magica, yeah. Um, but then I went on to play uh, Vampire, which I thought that was a a good uh, game as well. And and I'm might be the one that got into into RPGs at the youngest age, um, but. I had a couple of neighbors that uh, were into original Dungeons and Dragons, like the Red Book, um, and uh, so they had us play some of those games with them every once in a while. But the one that we liked the best was uh, Mutants and Masterminds, or not Mutants and Masterminds, sorry, Mutants Down Under, um, and it was like a spin-off of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, or, um, it's kind of complicated, uh, what the exact relation is, but we just picked animals and made them characters out of them, and, uh, so it was a lot of fun, and, uh, that kind of escalated when, uh, like, in grade school when I met Dan, and, as he mentioned, his uh, our friend's brother gave us some books of the advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and so then our interest took off from there a lot more. Um, but when I was young, um, we didn't have the Mutants Down Under book, so we just kind of, a friend of mine who lived couple houses over we would just make up kind of our own system and roll like just dice we had stolen from Yahtzee um and uh and kind of played our own way um so I don't know I've kind of been into um gaming since there's been some breaks but um I've always collected books. The collecting aspect um, is is probably what uh, has kept me around uh, the most, or whatever. You know, even when I wasn't playing, I uh, you know wanted to see what was in the the complete handbook of barbarians. You know, and so half price books. <laughs> I, that's uh, kind of. I think Matt bought out like two or three half price books worth of uh, used books in <laughs> in various. <laughs> yeah. books. I remember yeah. anytime playing with Matt, he would just bring this like massive box uh, to the game, you know, just filled, <laughs> floated to the brim with books. I mean, there had been fifty pounds of books in that thing every time. <laughs> yeah, I'm addicted to the. To the cheap splat books, <laughs> if it's a uh... well, I'm I'm not one to talk given the given the fact that I would go into bookstores and just bookstores and libraries and just read until opening to close. <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah. Get a taster of it. No, just read, <clears throat> just read, ev just read every single book I could get. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I've I've told this in the past, but as a result of that, I ended up getting the <laughs> I end up get I end up getting the I end up getting the keys to the a spare set of keys to the library because they're like because the person nice. who's running it was like you're in you're in here all the damn time I may as well. Which I didn't think he was serious until he gave me a set of keys just saying, don't burn the place down. Hell yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Man, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Hope you kept that promise. <laughs> right. I'm not a pyro. I'm not going to burn I'm not gonna burn something down. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, le when I left that area, I, get, I, gave him the, I gave him the keys back because I was heading into another township. <laughs> But that's good. You didn't hang on to him then. Yeah. But um, with this particular project, Savage Earth, 
this is a this is a realm of fantasy that a lot of a lot of developers don't really touch this sort of pre the sort of pre civilization primitive style. Um, of all of all kinds of settings, what made you guys go with this kind of approach? Well, I mean, part of it is exactly what you just said. Um, a lot of people just don't touch this, and and I, when I was young, um, I remember there was an A D and D um, Forgotten Realms book that took place in like a, a savage continent or something, and had a lot of like dinosaurs and and that sort of thing. It had a, all the other D and D monsters and races and all that sort of stuff. But it was a little more like, um, you know, it had a lot of like stone weapons and, and that sort of thing. I thought that was really, really cool. And I, I've also been like just completely obsessed with dinosaurs since since before I could, you know, what's related to me from from family members from before I can even remember. Um, and so I always really, really liked the idea of having uh, that, that sort of a setting. And uh, a few times Matt... Uh, Jake and I actually uh, just kind of played some D and D games where we just sort of threw in a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, kind of tried to make it a little more primitive, and then you know, Savage Earth just kind of grew out of that. Um, it was you know, it was just kind of the you know, I I always thought it was a cool setting. People, do, you know, a, a lot of games sort of touch on this, like oh, let's throw dinosaurs in there, but it's always still like. High fantasy plus dinosaurs, or sci-fi plus dinosaurs, or you know, western plus dinosaurs, and uh, why not primitive technology plus dinosaurs? And so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of where that uh, that sort of started, I guess. Curiosity: Has anyone brought up Primal to you guys? The uh, the um, animate the short animated the animated short. Tarkovsky. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of it, but yeah. <laughs> yes. And that, and that actually, you know, when I saw that, I was like, they stole my idea, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I do. I do love it though. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, yes, yes, it, it is. And, and there's actually a, a, a video game that, um, is a, an adventure game that was on Kickstarter a few years ago, um, that, uh, that I had back that reminded me of those shorts as well. Um, or actually, I guess that probably would have been about the same time that those were coming out. Um, and it's also so, somewhat similar to that, where like, uh, you know, primitive people living with dinosaurs and, and a, a lone wanderer and their dinosaur companion type thing. But uh, yeah, those, uh, those, those shorts kick ass. And I get the main reason that, I'd br that I wanted to bring that up is because I could see people bringing that up to you. Right, yeah. If if it was, um, I mean, we're not trying to copy off anything here, but it, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, and like I said, I, I, we, uh, two of us here were were working on this this sort of this project uh, long before those shorts ever came out. Now they, of course, may have been working on it long before we ever came up with the idea, but you know, we, uh, you know, actually, honestly, it was one of those things that when I saw that, I was like, hell yeah, there is interest in this kind of thing like th this is something people like um and and yeah it it uh i won't lie though too yeah that that did sort of like um energize us a little bit or or myself at least that you know like oh this is really cool and, and again like I, I i love everything about those things the, the the animation style and everything is so awesome but uh, yeah we uh i want to say the first game of savage earth I mean, it wasn't really quite Savage Earth yet, but getting there um, uh, probably was in 2008 or something. So it was just one of those things that we, uh, you know, were homebrewing and stuff. And eventually it was like, hey, we should try and actually make this at some point. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess a couple of years ago or so, we, you know, decided to form a business and start, uh, you know, trying to work toward that goal and, you know, some other goals of the stuff that we've done. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the, or when it comes to the early days of Savage Earth, was this, was this originally a, a campaign setting for a D20 based game that just took on a life of its own with time? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. 
that's, yeah. that's pretty much exactly what it was. Yeah, we, originally what we did was we kind of used existing D&D races, but we, we sort of limited it to like uh, ones that could be considered more like animalistic or, or primal kind of, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like you couldn't play as an elf, for instance. You couldn't play as a dwarf, you know, or... or or that sort of thing. Like it was, you know, I think we had humans in there, but you know, it was more like hobgoblins and, and lizard men and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and again, like it, we, we dropped all the like magical monsters, you know, essentially, you know, and, and that sort of thing and tried to try to keep it with like either extinct animals or real world animals that, that populated this world. And, and yeah, that's kind of what the, you know, ended up leading into what Savage Earth would become. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, it's it says that you guys have are where you are using are using a game in are, this is a game inspired by modern editions. The vibe that I ended up getting was a heavily streamlined D twenty. Is that the general direction you're going in? Yeah, you're not wrong there i think that that's you know uh obviously there there is a lot of aspects of 5e and and you know second edition pathfinder in there but yeah i mean it it you know we started off in ad and d second edition and then uh moved on to third edition because it was you know the skills system uh was like oh this is super useful and you don't have to you know uh uh commit yourself to like a limited you know well it wasn't called skills back then wasn't it just called proficiencies in uh, second edition yeah in AD and D yep yeah uh so it's like all right well this kind of expands some options and uh allows people to kind of free form their character a little bit more but it's also a little bit too complex so uh you know we tried to step away a little bit from that of course but uh yeah, I would say, yeah, maybe if this was like, we could potentially call this D20 primitive or something like that. <laughs> and, I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's super streamlined. Like it, it is definitely streamlined in those senses that Jake was just talking about. Um, but, I mean, there is still a little crunchiness to it, you know, um, for lack of a better term. it's uh definitely has some, you know, a little bit of like 3.5 in that aspect but again like he said we uh, kind of took inspiration from some modern more modern role playing games to make some of that you know leveling up and stuff like that a little bit easier um as far as just you know the time to do it um but it is is you know still does have a level of complexity to it to where like as opposed to in 5th edition where, you know, your characters might not be super customizable because it's so streamlined. You know, we wanted to stay away from that uh, because we really like, you know, having more replayability, essentially, if you can kind of play different types of characters even within the same class, you know. So, yeah, mm. kind, of, kind of a mishmash, mishmash of those and we've kind of been sort of promoting it a, a little bit or sometimes referring to it as the D20 greatest hits. You know, it's it's oh, a little bit Oh, the claim that 5e made and couldn't and couldn't back up. Right, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we we're, we're we're trying to actually work towards that, you know, a little bit of the streamlinedness that comes from 5e and PF2 um with a little bit more of the crunchiness of PF1 and and uh 3.5 and and honestly there's even some like uh, the D20 Star Wars, there's a there's a little bit of inspiration from that. You know, D20 Modern, there's a little bit of ins inspiration from that, you know. And honestly, even even um we've tossed in a little of, of some of the classic world of darkness, like some of the ways that uh that some of the stuff work is a little closer to that than I hope you weren't than, taking uh... notes from Mage in that regard. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The last thing we need in a, in a low in a low fantasy primitive setting is a magic system that makes re that bends over re that bends reality over on the table. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, we don't have that. Yeah, I, I'd actually like to think that the our magic system is one of the things that we really, um, and and it doesn't really touch too much of that in those in those uh, those quick start rules. We we kind of left held that back out of that a little bit, but um, I'm pretty proud of what we've kind of come up with for our magic system. We we've, we've really tried to like keep it so I tried to make it a little I guess a little more like video gaming, you know, like like some of the magic. Uh, how would, that would, might be used in a video game as opposed to a tabletop game. Um, it's it's mana based as opposed to spells per day based. The the idea there being that you don't have to spend every day in game with you know if you got three magic users, that's three people that are like oh, okay. Well, today I want to look through this whole book and find out what you know six spells I can cast today and stuff. You know, we try to keep it a little more like oh, this is what you can cast. You know, and and we try to keep that list fairly expansive and and grows obviously as they level up but um but, you know that try to try to remove some of that like in between time in between days that that uh that people have to like kind of slow the game down to you know i mean if you got if if you're that one fighter and and everybody else is either a a sorcerer or a wizard or a, or a cleric or something, you know, you're kind of sitting there twiddling your thumbs for, for half an hour, you know, every game mm-hmm. session. Or well, more. <laughs> all right, or more. Yeah, well, everybody determines what spells per day they're going to pick for today and stuff. And so, oh. not, that, not that there's anything wrong with the spells per day. It, it's a great system. It's, you know, worked for decades and stuff and, and is good. But that's one of the, the one of the big changes that we kind of like. Hey, let's try to like really make this just a quick fire type type thing. The decisions are obvious, that sort of thing. And... Plus, being a, a primitive setting, you know, like it it to me doesn't make sense that you'd have that uh, type of limitation. It's not like most people in this game are going to be walking around with spell books. Uh, you know, there's a good portion of people who don't know how to write at all. So it you know the whole memorization of a spell aspect just really doesn't uh doesn't really mesh with the setting all that well anyway and who yeah. has the time when you're running from dinosaurs <laughs> right <laughs> or foraging for your next meal yeah well the other thing the other thing is because of the fact that you guys are streamlining it sounds like the problem of Mages being able to be a do everything button isn't as much of a factor. Yeah, yeah it's, it's more specific. You know, it's more type of. Um, you get a certain number of spectrums, uh, which are kind of like the you know domains. The domains, yeah. Thank you. Um, and you know, based on what spectrums you pick, you're kind of allotted. Um, a couple, you know, like uh, one basically a cantrip, but it, it, there's no real cantrips in it. You know, it's still anything you cast is going to cost you mana to to cast. Um, so it's more sparse in that sense. You really have to pick your spots, and based on what spectrums you have, you're just going to have a few options of things to cast. Obviously, as you you know level up and get stronger in certain spectrums, you know, you'll get more powerful versions of the ones you already know. And in addition to, you know, like a a few more uh, things that you're able to do, but they're kind of restricted within that type of spectrum, which are like, you know, for example, you know, the fire spectrum, the water spectrum, the body spectrum, mind spectrum, um, you know, things like that, where it's like, that's, instead of schools of magic, you know, it's kind of uh, grouped in like like so, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Pathfinder 2nd Edition because there's a couple aspects within it that are that are that I think a lot of people overlooked when Pathfinder 2nd came out. One of them being the action point setup, where they had three... that You have three action points, and every action takes one, two, or three of them. Sometimes spells have additional effects if you spent, if you use more actions, um, which was a little bit undercooked, but that's Paizo for you. 
<laughs> they come up with good idea. Paizo comes up with good ideas and then and then doesn't fully explore them. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm curi what I'm curious about is what is whether or not you guys. I know you. I know you're not doing the whole six action types, but were you considering doing that action point setup? Not uh, not defined as points, but essentially just uh, what like standard, uh, full round, and free actions. Essentially, so just the three categories uh, kind of helps simplify things, so you're not having to. Okay, I did that action type. Now let me read and see if I can do another action type and. Uh, the other that. thing, in regard to Pathfinder Second Edition, that I f I feel is worth noting is Second Edition really doubled down on its feat system, having different categories of feats throughout. Um, are you guys go Are you guys going on a similar on a similar path with with different ch um, choosable feats at every level for a class? It's not necessarily every level, um, but it it's relatively frequently. You know, you you do you do have access. It depends on your class, of course. Um, some classes do get a lot more feats than other classes, but every class gets at least some feats. Um, and and we do have a pretty expansive list of of feats. It's it's not a small uh, it's not a small list. That, that's part of where we really wanted that. Um, that customization to be able to come in, you know, is that, uh, is that, you know, there's a lot of feats and a lot of them are available to everyone, I guess it is, you know, not, not that we don't have some prerequisites for a lot of the feats we do, but, um, we, we wanted to kind of get away from the, like, only really the fighter can pick this feat or only really a, a rogue can fit, pick this feat. You know, we kind of wanted to stray away from that just a little bit. There's yeah. one concept with feats that I'm curious if you guys tried to stray away from as well. And that is prerequisite hell. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that we have done a pretty good job. Most most feats, if they have a prerequisite, really just usually have one or maybe two. Um we also kind of not not completely, but for the most part we did away with like Feats that are prerequisites for other feats. You know what I mean? We, we've kind of gotten rid of that. Instead, what we sort of went to is that um, almost more like how mutants and masterminds did it, where like their their feats kind of could, some of them had ranks. And so you could pick the same feat, you know, maybe three times and you get three ranks in it. That kind of replaces the, the oh, you have to have this feat, then you can pick this feat, then you can pick this feat. You know, so we, we kind of tried to go with that a little bit. But I, I would like to think that we kind of did get, a, get away from some of the uh, prerequisite hell that uh, that some games have had. Yeah, uh, here's a good example of one of the feats that uh, is never a feat in any other game is uh, rage. Um, pretty much anybody can, can rage in this. It just seemed right to allow everybody to be able to <laughs> to go into a rage in a in a primitive uh setting like this um of course certain classes you might not want to do that but uh it is available to everybody at you know certain uh base attack bonus uh minimums i think mm -hmm. and of course the other thing that i know the other thing and this is the last thing when it comes to pathfinder second is the fact that they especially doubled down on proficiencies, having different levels of proficiency throughout that that one could access, and at higher levels being able to get legendary proficiency. Um, is that one... It, are you guys considering something similar for your project? The thing that comes to mind as far as skills and, like, uh, you know, proficiency levels... Uh, goes would probably be the crafting system of uh i mean specifically tool making you know you start off uh being able to you know make the stone versions of whatever tools you know that you use or weapons that you make um and then uh you know as you 
rank up, you know, you get a little better at it. You get to, uh, you know, kind of expand your options kind of as if your character was kind of ranking up technologically, I guess. Um, and then at the very tippy top of that, uh, uh, crafting rank system having a, you know, basically uh, primitive metallurgy, you know, like uh, kind of as if your character was coming into the Copper Age or something along those lines. Yeah, so not just, not just you know, increasing your bonus to a check, but actually expanding what you're able to even attempt uh as you get better at certain things, yeah. Yeah. Now, when it comes to... I'd like to talk a bit about classes. Since, obviously, this is going to be the most important... Your choice of class is going to be the most important decision that a player is going to make. So, you guys have, ele you guys have 11 classes. And... I'm guessing. I'm guessing that within those, there's going to be some that are that are analogous to traditional fantasy classes, but those are in the extreme minority. Would that be accurate? I would. I would probably put it <clears throat> around fifty-fifty. You know, about about half of them are, are pretty similar to what you know. We we have something called a warrior that's pretty close to the fighter. You know. Uh, the rake, which is pretty close to the rogue, um, are, are we have three different magic using classes, and they're all pretty different than anything from like what you would find in in D anD D or Pathfinder. They're they're I mean, they're, they're, there's of course some similarities there, but but um, you know, there there's some pretty big differences too. I mean, some pretty major differences actually. Um, and then we have um, like a, a, a ranger like uh character called the uh called the hunter um that is yeah you know so somewhat similar to to the uh, ranger but then the rest of them are are pretty different than what you're going to find in pretty much any other fantasy role playing game mm -hmm. uh, and just just on that just on that example obviously the fighter has had the has had the reputation of the feature back in 3.5 and to a slightly lesser extent, Pathfinder, but still there, because again, Pi again, Paizo comes with, with comes up with ideas and then doesn't explore them. But what would what would the what would be the playstyle differences between the way a lot of people would expect a fighter to play versus the way a warrior plays in your system? I mean, there, a lot of it would, of course, still be pretty similar. You know, your it, it's your warrior's probably going to be, you know, your party's tank and and that sort of thing. Um, I would say one of the big, big differences, and this honestly kind of goes along with all the classes, but the warrior compared to the fighter would probably have one of the most stark differences, is that this game is meant to be fairly skill heavy, um, and so. Even your even your fighter, you know, is is going to be expected to be pretty good at least at, at a at least a few things, you know. Um, so that's that's definitely one of the differences in that in this in in Savage Earth. You kind of everybody really needs to be good at a, at at least a few skills, or or they're probably not going to make it. Now, are you are given what given what you said? Would that would that mean that you guys are are not are not having a big gap between the skill monkey class and everybody else? Oh, uh, there no, there still is. I mean, the the people who are specifically really good at skills do are are going to be that skill monkey, of course. You know, they're they're going to have even more than everybody else. But yeah, I mean, I I would say that yes, that that gap is a little bit, uh, uh you know. It, it's closed up a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's not quite as wide of a gap as, as what it would be in some other games. Yeah. Now, I'm guessing that, since you mentioned the whole thing with feats, I'm guessing that you guys have feats um, put, in, put into different subcategories. 
<laughs> no, but we probably should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they're they're not in subcategories. I mean, there are still, um, uh, you know, class feats. Not in the sense of you have to be this class to take this feat, but there are, um, you know, certain feats that, as a certain class levels up, they get access to. You know, you're going to get a class feat at third level or whatever it is. Uh, and, you know, you, you can only choose from this specific list out, you know, for that feat. Um, now, there's a, some other, at a different level, you might get a feat where you can choose from any of the feats. Um, but there are some where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, you can only choose from this class list. Um, but no, we, we don't really have them separate it out in any other way i don't think yeah. um i know some games ha some games that try to go for a more lower fantasy approach or even sword and sorcery um will put will put a cap will put a lower cap on le on leveling um i've seen some where they put the where they put the cap at 5 or even te or even 10th level are you guys doing that or are you guys going with the 20 level full monty I mean, we do have a built out to twentieth. Um, yeah. yeah, so and we, and we didn't really plan to ever have any kind of uh, capping on on leveling. I mean, that I guess if we if that was to be in the game, that would I guess just be you know a function of the DM if if that was something they wanted to do is that uh, everybody you'll we'll only play to this level and then we're done, you know, or something like that. But yeah. Now, I think it's time for me to address one of the big elephants in the room that's sitting on what used to be my couch. There was a couch there; it's not there anymore. <laughs> why is it? Why is it not that any, there anymore? Because an elephant sat on it. <laughs> Could be a mammoth, though, too. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, then this then my couch still wouldn't be there anymore. It's just a bunch right, of wood yeah. and cloth. <laughs> but. It's time to it's time to tackle the magic question. Cause I know that you guys are do doing what you refer to as an unburdened unburdened magic system. And what I'm curious about is since I know that you want to simplify and I know that you definitely don't want to do the Vancian model, which truth be told, I've never been a big fan of to begin with. Um but how are you having magic work? Are you treating magic as its own skill? You could kind of think of it like that. It's it's not the way it works in in this is that I mean it, it, a little bit. Um, it works almost identical to the skills. It, it's kind of how it works. But it is it's something that the the magic using classes um, all have a starting feat that allows them to use magic. And that then provides them with points that they allocate towards these spectrums that they have access to. And then based on the ranks of those spectrums, that's what determines what, what spells they can cast, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can get points and either, uh, you know, spread them around uh, real early or, you know, they could potentially save up their points and really, you know, buy into a, a rank that would be generally difficult to get to at a lower level. So uh, there's a bit of flexibility in what a spellcaster uh, can have access to, but it's always limited by how much mana they have. You know, they maybe they get this one really badass spell at a relatively low level, but they might only be able to cast that once and, and kind of uh, not be able to cast much else for that day, you know. Mm -hmm. I and think our uh, mana uh, regeneration um, system is probably uh, pretty unique um, when compared to other games. Um, we don't just have a you refresh in the morning or after a rest or something, uh, each character determines what their ritual is to replenish that uh, 
that mana and then they have to like perform that uh that that right um to to get back their um their mana so i think that's kind of cool because it yeah i could provide provide them with an example um i was playing uh this uh you know, bird-like humanoid. Um, and uh, I wanted him to have the capability to use fire spells. And I don't know if it was just in the character creating process or what I had chosen uh, the food prep skill. And so in my mind, I started to put, you know, pieces together like, all right, so it's it's about, you know, relating the sun to f- to your fire and fire to like a hearth or something along those lines. So my character's ritual of replenishment is what we call it to get your mana back was to uh, basically prepare a, uh, you know, a, a better than just roasting meat on a spit, you know, type thing, uh, type meal, and then leaving it out in the sun as a sacrifice to, you know, that, god of fire slash the sun um and so that's kind of an example of just like a relatively i guess simple ritual of replenishment yeah um, the, uh, the, oh go ahead sorry okay. well i was just gonna say yeah like like matt had said uh the 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 ritual system is is also another part of it where you you also get these rituals as you level up as well that don't cost mana but have these bigger longer lasting effects but all magic users at at first level get the the ritual of replenishment and and yeah like matt was saying and, and what jake just described there is you you kind of would work with your your gm at the beginning of the game to come up with based on what your god or your pantheon of gods is that that this character uh worships to come up with something that makes sense for that for that uh, character and and you know it's it's meant to be something that's a very easy to do you shouldn't have to find all these really difficult ingredients or anything like that but something that you can't just fall asleep and wake up and and you've got you know that that's kind of the what what we tried to come up with there and one one last thing on the magic um and correct me if I'm wrong about this but um so since, as Dan mentioned, I think um, the magic classes, what makes them magic is they have a, you know, the magic classes all get it at level one is a, a feat, actually, that gives you the ability to, you know, commune with your gods and you're able to have this, you know, magical ability. Um, but I, I think any class can take that eventually. Is that correct, guys? Or... That is correct. Yep. Yeah. So as long as it's you know narratively makes sense, you know, as long as you have your character can justify it within the narrative of your campaign, um, you know, your warrior or your you know other you know a non magical class could use if they wanted to use one of their level up feats mm-hmm. to take the the favored feat, then they could then gain you know the entry level magic abilities as well. So Yeah. Now given given that it sounds like it would be relatively easy to gish. I'm unfamiliar with that term. <laughs> I don't think I am with you. Yeah. I ended up learning that term from my mentor and everybody seems to be unfamiliar with it. <laughs> but <laughs> Especially, especially since the term the term the term gish isn't even all that new. Like it it come it's yeah. its roots come from the first time that get that um gith zerai were playable. Oh, gotcha. All right. But gotcha. gish is a, is a nickname for character archetypes that are built around being being both martial and magical. Gotcha. Um, the er, the elf in the early days of D and D could be one case, even if it's a really overpowered case. It's still one case, right? 
Um, and there's there's countless other examples of this of that particular um, archetype. Yeah, I mean, yes, it would be the answer to that because I mean, really, I mean, almost anyone, if you know, if they wanted to, they could they could take the favored feet, you know, when when if they've got the, you know, once they do get to the point where they can they can take a. Uh, any feat they want, they could uh, they could take the favored feat, and and then they would be able to cast magic. Now that doesn't give them like the access to be able to purchase all these other ranks. For that, they would have to like multi class in one of the magic using classes. What what the what just taking that feat does is it, it one allows them to then later, ma you know. You have to have this feat before you can multi-class in a magic using class if you didn't start out as a magic user. And it really only gives you just the like the lowest of the low your your cantrips essentially, you know, is kind of how you could think of it if you were comparing it to uh to a you know D and D or something. It would give them those types of abilities. So they're not, you know, these aren't you know, with with just getting this feat, you know, this warrior can't be like casting fireballs or lightning bolts or anything like that. You know, they they could maybe like heal a hit point or two, or you know, that's what I was gonna say. Uh, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, or or you know, keep themselves warm in a in a cold environment for for a little while until they can get a fire going or something like that. You know, it's 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 much lower stuff. But you know, if they did want to multi class, then then yes, you know, anyone could. The other, there, there does kind of, and, and a lot of this is, you know, meant to be done narratively, and, and we will really try to outline this out in, in the book, um, is that, and I know a lot of games do this, and, and, you know, with varying degrees of success, because it all really just depends on players and the, and the GM of how much they want to enforce this, but it's really meant to be that if you are one of the favored, meaning you, you have that favored feat and, and the gods are granting you the ability to, to do magic, you are supposed to come with some gameplay negatives. You know, you can't eat meat. You can only eat meat. You have to, you know, spend at least three hours a day praying and you can't be doing anything else, you know, during that time. Or you can't, you know, or can only use certain weapons or you can only, you know, that sort of thing and stuff. You, you can't wear armor or you, you know what have you. Um, and so even the characters that aren't necessarily magic using characters, but are favored and, and or magic using classes, but are regular classes that have the favored feet and thus can, can use magic. They would also be bound by, by at least some of those rules that, you know, and so that, and, and, Again, like, you know, I know that depending on... Because I've played plenty of games where, you know, someone plays as a paladin who, who has absolutely no restrictions. And, you know, things like that and stuff. And so a lot of that is, you know, mm -hmm. would have to be adjudicated uh, by the by the GM and stuff. But Yeah. Now, one of the big things that you guys have focused on, from what, I re from what I'm aware, is your crafting system, which is one of those things that... Even the proiest of the pros struggle with, and um, and fifth edition hilariously decided to throw in the towel with Crawford doing that whole. Oh, we left it blank so that you guys could come up with it, which <laughs> was the which was probably the <laughs> dumbest thing you could do because now other people are gonna are going to make crafting systems and they're gonna make money off of it that could have been yours. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're. <laughs> When we first started playing this game, uh, and I, it's still, uh, you know, it was one of those house rules that became a rule, um, was since we were using more primitive weapons, uh, if you critically failed, you know, your weapon broke. And it might not be quite as brutal in this, but it still is likely to happen. I could see um, that being put in as a hardcore mode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, if, yeah... We'll have a table of like, all right, these other things could happen as well. Weapon breakage might be on there. Um, but yeah, the you know, if you want to go true survival mode, anytime you roll a one, that weapon is gone. So then you have or, to figure or even, out. I remember even we, we just, uh, you know, years ago and stuff playing around and stuff, we even had it that if you critically hit, you still got your critical hit, 
but your weapon broke. You know? Yep. Yeah. You still did a critical hit, but you you lost your weapon in the process. You used yeah. too much force. Yeah. Right. The only yeah. thing that I the the only thing that I would advise against in the in that kind of situation if you're going to bring in durability into this, don't have don't have durability points for weapons because that's just one more thing to track, and one right. more thing you're going to have to balance. Exactly. Yeah. And and honestly, in in those early early first days before it even was. Um, uh, Savage Earth, and it was just AD and D uh, being played primitively, you know, in a primitive setting. Uh, we we were doing exactly that, you know, tracking armor and and you know shields and and weapon, you know, everything had durability points. And yeah, that was that was one of the very first things I think too much we started going. Yeah, we were just like, yeah, this is this is going away. <laughs> you know, we'll get rid of this. Uh, so yeah, that, you know, kind of became the impetus for having a, an advanced crafting system and, uh, yeah, we, you know, try to keep it relatively simple. I mean, most stone age weaponry is pretty simple, you know, that's why it transfers so well because, you know, to make, uh, most weapons in the game, you're going to need a haft, a blade or, you know, spearhead of some sort, depending on what type of weapon it is, uh, and then sinew. And that's, you know, you got three components, and you'll have a DC for the item or weapon in the equipment chapter. And so, in order to make that, you just go to the equipment cha chapter, see what the DC, the craft DC is for that, and you, you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tried to do away with, the, like, you know, some of the older D20 where... Okay, you figure up the weapon's cost, and then you need the materials, and then you roll, and you did so much money worth, I think it's... Eight silver that, pieces uh, per right, day. Right, yeah, and you yeah, did yeah, so much, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we, we kind of got rid of all that. Like like Jake said, we've got a, f a few categories of, of basically ingredient types, and uh, and you need, you know, every weapon description just says, this weapon is made with this, this, and this, and here's the DC you need to roll to, to create it. And, and that's how you, that's how you craft, you know? And so, I mean, it's, it's, it, it kind of is a little complex and a little crunchy, but the actual rules and doing it, we tried to make as simple as possible, you know, even more simple than, than some of these games that in my mind have pretty shitty crafting rules and then also it's shitty that, you know, it's not really used that much and it's not really, you know, and so we tried to uh, find a nice balance there of like, you know, different ingredients, things to find. It's also kind of one of those things too, because since, you know. We can curse on here, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just checking. All right, go ahead, Dan. This is one of those things that, uh, you know, we don't, we, we don't have, uh, you know, dragons guarding hordes of gold or, or things like that, you know. So when you kill a, when you kill a saber-toothed tiger or you kill a, a velociraptor, it's not going to be carrying bags of gold or, or, you know, whatever, you know, copper pieces with it and all this crap. And so that, that was part of the impetus for the whole crafting system to begin with was the, like, well, if we're going to have these primitive creatures... What what would the loot be? And then, well, okay, the loot is them. You know, the loot is their skin. It's their teeth. It's their meat. You know, and and their claws. And then that that then it's translated into one of these categories that we use for crafting. And then that's you know, and and so we try to keep that pretty simple. That it's just, um, you know, a, a creature similar to like how a weapon has what the what the crafting uh, requirements are. Creatures, the entry for the creature would have basically its, you know, quote unquote loot that would just be like, okay, well, it's got a maximum of this much teeth, the size of a, of a pelt that's, that's uh, this damage reduction, it can provide this much armor, blah, 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 you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And the thing... I'm guess I'm guessing that also ties into the fact that you're using a barter resources approach because obviously you can't you can't use a gold or silver standard when nobody knows what the hell gold or silver is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. The 
the main, you know, like what all things measure up to in this is actually meat because we figure everyone, all the different uh, species in this game, sentient species can use all this stuff. So, uh, you know, meat is always useful, you know, uh, even if it's just to feed your pet or whatever, you know. Yeah, meat is the, a pound of meat is kind of the, the uh, monetary standard, if you will, of this game. Uh, but when it also when it comes to when it comes to item creation and you you given the games that you've played you know this is coming you have no idea how thankful I am that even though even with the influences you guys have you are not doing that whole spend XP to cre to create items bullshit. No, hell no. God, I, yeah. So that was something, that, and I think Matt will probably remember this from back in our AD and D days. It was like, what the fuck is this? Like, why? Why do you get less experienced by doing this? Like, it's right. not that you Never get less experience. experience. You're spending the experience you have. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's just it made no sense to me whatsoever. That that, yeah. No. Definitely not. <laughs> I have in all in all of my years of experience, I have yet to hear anyone defend that i've had people <laughs> defend some of the ridiculousness of magic item creation in say third edition or def or or claim th or in one person's in this case claim that claim that third edition was more balanced than i give it credit for um the fact that Co the fact that codzilla exists would call that into question but the but i have yet to hear anyone defend the whole spend experience for met for magic items. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean that. Speaking to that point, uh, that's some of the stuff that, and I know that other editions now have removed that as well, or I assume they have. Uh, you know, like the shadow damage that like takes experience points away and stuff like that. We we don't want to have to make someone D level because they managed to survive a fight it just doesn't make sense and it's also not uh not fun for the players for sure i mean it's like nothing worse than de-leveling <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i can't imagine playing a game and getting in a fight against something with level drain and losing a level or two and being like yeah I i'm gonna keep playing i think i would just be like hell with this i'm done with this campaign i look at level right. i look at level drain as one of those as one of those things as one of those things that i that is in the category of i never use because yeah, i don't same. like things that are going to out. as i had to, i grew up with nintendo hard and there and i as well as as well as bullshit like the plutonia experiment for doom 2 and uh, yep <laughs> there was a very fine line between challenging and bullshit Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And also, also, I'd be remiss if I did, if I didn't. It's also the reason why anytime I load up um, Doom Two or or just about any um just about any shooter, I never play on the hardest difficulty because that's where it crosses the line. Where the whether it be the infinite spawning monsters in Nightmare or way, or yeah. way too or way too many goddamn grenades in World at War. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, no, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, I tend to shy away from that as well because you just yeah. you end up just frustrated also, by the end. Of also, Tomb of Horrors is overrated. I'm just putting that out there right now. <laughs> I haven't played it, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, that was that. That was that infamous um mo module that module, supposedly yeah. supposedly Gygax made because his players were complaining that things were getting too easy oh gotcha <laughs> okay <laughs> which i can't i can't imagine that scenario well if someone's complaining about something being too easy i think you can figure out what's going to happen next right yeah yeah right <laughs> you want div you want difficulty motherfuckers i'll give you difficulty right. but yeah hell yeah yeah what are you shooting for as far as a total page count since you're planning on it you're planning on this all in one thing 
I think we're probably shooting for around 300 pages. It might be a little more than that. It might be a little less than that. But I, I think that's probably about where where it would where it would probably hit. I mean, I don't know. Probably at least 300 pages, I guess. <laughs> well, Which, I'll put it that way. I'd say that's to, I'd say that's to be expected. Right. Oh. But I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you, f well, all four of you, sorry, for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> right, hell yeah well i'm uh, yeah. i'm on the i'm on the right page already then that's good uh, yeah <laughs> and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is mildra i am your gaming monk Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>